Hello, I'm Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks for joining us. Well, Tom Benson has experienced major triumphs in his career. He's also felt major heartbreak. The latter must have included this week as he went to court to hear members of his family challenge his mental competence. This happened in the same week that Benson's basketball team welcomed a new coach and the football team began on-field preparations for a new season. We'll look tonight at Benson's week in and out of the courtroom. We'll also examine the latest in the jazz market investigation. The legislature races the clock and restaurateurs facing shortages in a critical area. At our table are tonight's informed sources. Errol Laborde, producer of informed sources. Stephanie Grace, columnist, the New Orleans advocate. Larry Holder, sports columnist, NOLA.com, the Times-Picayune. And David Hammer, investigative reporter, WWL-TV, Channel 4. We're going to go to Larry first and talking about Tom Benson's week. Um, we've seen video of him all this week going to and fro the courtroom on the arm of his lawyer, Phil Whit Whitman, telling reporters, and really he's the only one talking other than the attorney for his family, for Benson's family, um, saying that he's strong, he's in it, he's run the organizations for 50 years. but. There's been a lot going on behind courtroom, the courtroom doors, but we really don't know exactly why. I'm going to anticipate it's very troubling for him, very troubling for the family because it is mud slinging everywhere. I mean, basically, uh, the three R's, uh, Rita, Ryan, and Renee, are trying to prove that their grandfather and great grandfather uh, are not capable of making rational decisions and are not capable of changing the succession plan of the ownership to give uh, to Gail. And uh, I remember the last time I was on the show, I would just come back from Phoenix, and I, that's really the only interview Tom Benson has given a full-length interview uh, to where he, you could see in him that it hurt him. And this is long before they had to go to court. And so I'm sure all of this is being played out. I know. Uh, earlier today, Dennis Lauscher, uh, the team president, took the stand, so it means the defense is starting to make their case, and I'm sure, uh, and yesterday, of course, uh, Rita LeBlanc was up there for the entire day, and I'm sure it was a back and forth contentious, look, she's having to really throw mud at her great-grandfather who, uh, look, she loves, her, her and grandfather. yeah, her, her grandfather. yeah, her grandfather who she loves, <laughs> and yet she wants to be the owner of the Saints and the Pelicans. She was reportedly on the stand, once again we say reportedly because the media can't get in there, the judge wouldn't allow it, um, but she was on the stand over two, day, over two days for eight hours. That is a long time to be on the witness stand. That's really grueling. Well, other than Tom, she is the central figure uh, of all this because she was going to be groomed as the face of the franchise. And it's really, uh, my colleague Jeff Duncan reported, it really came down to one of the things that uh, broke I guess the Campbell's back was an altercation between Rita and Gail, and that would really led to uh, Tom firing Rita uh, right at, on the day after Christmas. She got the notice that she was fired, and so that really kind of sped up the process to get this uh, the succession plan changed. And so it's yeah, it, it, her and Tom are really the the, the centerpieces to this puzzle. Isn't it difficult to prove incompetence? Yes, everyone I've talked to. Uh, says that this is really uh, a challenge for the three R's. It will be something to where uh, that they have to prove he really uh, is what they accused him of, did not know the president, lives on jelly beans and ice cream or whatever they accused when the, when the, uh, the, the file lawsuits were first filed. And so <laughs> to me, this would be more of the, if, if the three R's can win this, this would really squash the whole thing because it would give the team back to them. It would reverse the decision that he's not capable of doing that. So if Tom wins this part, you still have to go on to how do you match the assets within the trust. So it's kind of, to me, the shortcut. Uh, if you, it's like the Grand Slam. If you hit this, you win it, and you cut off everything kind of at, at, the, at its legs. And if the kids win, then it would totally throw the organization into disarray because all the people who work there are loyal to Tom and Gail, right? I would be loyal to the person signing my paychecks yeah. as well. <laughs> right. And so, yes, they are, look, everyone is turned on. Uh, Rita, Ryan, and Renee. It's completely, they're on one, they're kind of on an island. And I think as, uh, if you're a fan of the Saints and you're a fan of the Pelicans, uh, if they win and Tom Benson does not get his wishes, 
I have no idea what's going to happen within these organizations because I could see their, uh, you know, the three on the island being very spiteful and getting rid of everyone, uh, coaches, GMs, you name it, because they all turn their back and even say Mickey Loomis, Sean Payton. I don't know if they want to work for Rita, and I think that's a big key here as well. Well, well what's been going on this week is the competency hearing right. here in an Orleans Civil District Court. And we've seen Mr. Benson, like I said, going to and fro the courtroom every day he has been there, but we've not seen Gail Benson. That's curious, I, and I, I, I don't have a good answer for you. I'm, I'm wondering why that is. Uh, maybe the, he's trying to shield her. This doesn't have, maybe it's not, they're not they don't, he doesn't feel like she needs to be involved because this right now is his empire. It's, do, it's not hers until he dies. And uh, they've done, uh, they wanted to push her kind of behind the scenes once all this started. Uh, they had her involved in the owners' meetings a couple, uh, a couple months ago, but they are not trying to push her to the forefront yet, and I think this is part of it. Do you it. think there's a possibility this is going to end in some kind of deal that Tom Benson keeps his team and there'll be some sort of deal with the other, other part of the family? I would think that that would be the smartest way. It would stop all of this. I, actually, I think a deal would have been good already, but now that you're in court and now you're slinging mud at everyone, uh, I think we, we may be, on, be beyond that, uh, just because uh, it seems like they are full speed ahead and Rita and the, the other two R's, they want to be in command. And these proceedings are taking a little bit longer than what was anticipated. It's, it's thought that perhaps this will go into next week. Do you think Mr. Benson will be taking the stand? I think it's up to the judge if he's satisfied with what he's heard. <laughs> uh, if he's not, maybe he will. Uh, I think that's in his power to do so, but I, I'm sure preferably the defense does not want any part of that, of him being on the stand. Not an easy thing for both sides, I'm sure, this week right. and through court. All right. Thanks a lot, Larry. David, you have been filling us in over this past month or so about uh, the Library Foundation and money's going to the jazz orchestra and the jazz market. What's the latest that you well, found out? There's so many tentacles to this thing, and I've, over the past month I've done about 10 stories, so it's <laughs> hard to, you know, keep track of exactly where we are in this whole thing since the last time we talked about it, but I can basically give you the summary that, you know, this is about um, the money that went from the uh, Library Foundation when Irvin Mayfield, the jazz trumpeter, and his business partner, Ronald Markham, were in charge and of the Library Foundation, about a million dollars went to the jazz orchestra that pays their salaries. They each make six-figure salaries from the jazz orchestra, which was started by Irvin Mayfield. And what kind of disseminated from that is, you know, I reported that there's a federal investigation underway uh, because there's more than just that money involved, potential uh, improper payments. And one thing I found uh, about a week and a half ago was that um, he took a trip to Miami for the Library Foundation and their emails showing him trying to get more money than the Library Foundation leadership wanted him to have. Uh, he was getting um, seeking compensation as the cultural ambassador of the city of New Orleans for a, a book publishing deal that he wanted to put together for the Library Foundation and also had gone to Minnesota uh, to do some benefit concerts and the leadership at the time of the Library Foundation who left in 2008 said they never saw that money come into the Library Foundation. So there's a lot of questions about the Library Foundation finances and this week we found out that there are no audits going back to the years 2012, 2013, 2014 when these payments were made from the Library Foundation to the Jazz Orchestra. And the new leader of the Library Foundation, because Markham and Mayfield stepped down after these stories came out, after I did my first story, um, this guy, uh, Bob Brown, the former mm -hmm. business council, head of the business council, he's trying to get a handle of all this stuff and he's trying to go through what documentation there is and he's promising in 90 days to have a full report on that. And so, as your story reported though, they weren't required to have audits. Correct. They? The, because they don't get public money, they get private donations, foundations, and things like that. So, but the organization that does get public money is the Jazz Orchestra, which is also a nonprofit. And so what I found is that they've gotten about $1.1 million in state funding as well as other 
public funding from places like NORA, the New Orleans Redevelopment Authority, to go into building that jazz market. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so you got 1.1 million that they've gotten so far, but the state legislature said this week, that's it. We're not, you know, they're on tabs in the, in the capital outlay budget to get an additional 900,000, but we're going to cool it right now while this investigation is going on. And that would have gone, okay, uh, I was gonna Stephanie? Say, what's going to happen to that building now? They just had the grand opening. I know there was a big TED conference there next week. It's, it's kind of the centerpiece of that redevelopment on O.C. Haley. Well, the, I know they canceled one event that was scheduled to be there right after my story first came out, but then they did go ahead and have a very important 300th anniversary <coughs> kickoff event there, mm -hmm. um, a black tie event. They, uh, uh, The city and Chevron hosted it. They, they mm -hmm. uninvited Mayfield himself, wow. so he didn't play as was scheduled in the uh, invitation, but they still had the event. And I think the feeling is this is a beautiful project, it's really impressive, and the hope is that it will still be a viable community uh, center and jazz, you know, performance space, and that No Joe will be able to get back on its feet, and the issue really is about establishing was there library donation money that was misspent or public money that mm -hmm. went to the jazz orchestra that was misspent. You're going to continue to look into Absolutely. this, I would got I've got more more I'm working on. Okay, David, thanks a lot. Stephanie, yes. we are in the last days of a really serious session, we are, so tell yes. us where are we? Well, we're it? less than a week away. This time next week, we're going to be talking about everything we know. Now we're still speculating to some extent, but things are starting to fall into place to some extent. I mean, it looks like um, it looks like they've been able to find money for hospitals. You know, there's been some progress on that front, but there's also a lot. People are really at each other up there and a lot of the tension has to do with this thing called the save fund and you've heard something about this people have called it a gimmick uh, treasurer john kennedy called it nonsense on a stick really everybody hates this thing mm -hmm. except governor jindal who is demanding it basically and what it is is a kind of a phantom fee it's a fifteen hundred dollar fee that would be placed on students going to state colleges but they wouldn't have to pay it um, because it would be offset by a tax credit, an income tax credit. So what's the purpose? The purpose is to, because the money would be raised by a fee, not a tax, it doesn't count as a tax increase according to Governor Jindal and Americans for Tax Reform, this group we've talked about, that you know he signed the pledge to not ra raise, raise taxes tax. and pass a revenue neutral budget. So that is money raised on paper that's not a tax increase offset by a tax credit which having that tax credit allows you to go over here to a third place and say, okay, well, we can raise revenue over here and it's still revenue neutral. So where the money would actually come from would be things like raising the cigarette tax, some rollbacks on tax exemptions. You know, they're kind of looking everywhere and trying to cobble it together. So is the save tax or uh, fee, Fund fee. What, it's a <laughs> fee, is it still alive? Because it, it, it is it, still alive. Um, it was passed by the Senate. Senator Jack Donahue of uh, St. Tammany Parish is the sponsor. The House is really pushing back. They, there was a very contentious hearing that they had trouble even scheduling, where you know Jack Donahue came in and all these House members, Democrats and Republicans, I should say, this is not a partisan issue. This really crosses lines. Were demanding, you know, why are we doing this? How does it make sense? I mean, they're really trying to get him to say, this is just a gimmick, mm -hmm. and he. What he said is, this is the way we can get a budget that the governor will sign. Um, they've, they then voted it down. So then now Jack Donnie, who has tacked it onto some legislation sponsored by the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, who had voted against it. So there's, there's, every, that, there's jockeying, there's venting. I think they'll probably come to an agreement on it. But higher ed supports it. Higher ed supports it because there's money attached mm -hmm. to it and they need the money. And it would actually dedicate some money to higher ed that is not dedicated now. So, you know, they're, what they get out of it is they get the money that's raised over here by the cigarette tax and everything tax, else. Yes. Is there sentiment on, among the legislators that we should give a budget to the governor that he wants, that he, like, dares him to veto it, you know, in a way, there, to just to hold his feet to the I fire? I think some people are kind of fantasizing about that, but would they actually do it? 
part of the problem is nobody knows this has never happened before. No, the governor's never vetoed a full budget. No, the legislature certainly hasn't overridden such a veto. And the fiscal year ends July 1st. And if they actually came back into a veto session, that would be mid-July. So nobody even really, you know, federal government were used to this. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows how it would work. And so, you know, it's a huge risk. Yeah. But I think I, there are some people who I think would like to do it. Yeah. even if they won't actually pull the trigger. <laughs> and so the cigarette tax went up from cigarette what the house Cigarette tax is expected to go up. The, it was, the remember, the third lowest in the country, 36 cents. Um, it went up another 30, I think 32 cents in the House, and then the Senate added another 32. So it's it's it looks like it'll be a dollar at this point. It's definitely less than a week. How does it look like the universities are going to do? You know, I think, OK, not great. They, um, everybody agreed. At, ahead of time, there was this $1.6 billion shortfall. How much money they were going to try to raise, it was about $700 million versus how much they would try to cut from all sorts of different places. I think they're going to reach that. And at first, it looked like the universities were going to be made whole and health care would take a hit. But it looks like they're finding the money for health care. And that's, of course, very important to New Orleans because that includes the new medical center that's supposed to open. Well, so there's actually going to be staffing and oh, it, that's, it's it, actually going to operate? As of today, it looks like they're on track to get there. But we have uh, till next Thursday. Exactly. So we'll find out, I guess, on Friday. We'll be discussing this exactly. next week. Thanks a lot, sure. Stephanie. OK, the Pelicans have a new coach. Who is he? Alvin Gentry. He is currently not in New Orleans right now. He is actually mm -hmm. the lead assistant for the Golden State Warriors, and they just took a one to nothing lead last night over uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers and LeBron James. And he was really that, that hot name because he's the top assistant on the top team in the NBA. Now, he has old ties to the old Hornets before the Bensons took over. He was an assistant uh, before the ownership change. Uh, but he's someone, it's, it's, a, it's a different type of coach than Monty Williams. He's more offensive-based. Monty Williams is more defensive-based. So you're seeing basically, uh, use the analogy, when, when you break up with someone, you go after the 180-degree difference. It's kind of what you're doing here, but he's not. He he's been a former NBA coach. Took a team, uh, took the Suns to uh, the 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 Western Conference Finals once, and yet his career numbers are not all that great. So I understand people think he could be a safe hire. Some people are are high on him. Some people are not. I think it's a solid hire. I'm not going to say it's the best hire they could have ever made, but I think it it, it works for what maybe that what they're looking for. They're building a staff. The thing that I thought was really interesting that they hired two assistants. Well, I mean, he couldn't have been that involved in that because he's trying to deal with coaching in the in the NBA Finals, and they hired Robert Pack and another assistant coach, and I th I thought that was it seems like they're kind of building it in absentia for him. Well, no, look, he's making those hires. Uh, it's just like Sean Payton. Sean Payton makes the coaching hires, and when you're an NBA head coach, you make your assistant hires. So look, you know, hey, I'm, I'm up for this job. Uh, you you going to come with me if I get it? I, it, it? It works as easy as that. Mm. And so look, he had people in mind. They went and got Boston's top assistant who is a defensive guru. It's, it's like the roles are changed. Uh, so uh, the head coach is more offensive centric. The, the lead assistant will be more defensive centric. And so it's again, it's a, it's a different reverse uh, of what we're used to seeing. But you need something different uh, because, uh, look, even though the Pelicans did make the playoffs, they didn't make a great showing, and you've got one of the best players in the NBA, and you've got to pacify him, and you've well, got to get better. Well, speaking of that best player, I mean, I would assume that they have reached out to Anthony Davis already, and they're talking to him, and he's okay with this. Do we know? or? Well, it's really not up to him yeah. <laughs> I could, I, because, uh, look, he still has a the, – the Pelicans are able to finally uh, – give him an extension starting in July. And that's a big part of this because it's always the fear, well, is Anthony Davis going to stay? And uh, the Pelicans can offer the most money. So typically in these situations, money talks. I know before the show we were talking and I said, look, same thing with Chris Paul. Uh, the, the, when the Hornets were able to give him the maximum amount of dollars, he stayed regardless. So I'm assuming Anthony Davis is on board uh, I don't think he's ever he's come out and really said publicly if he's on board or not. But I'm assuming he he's more he's not one of these guys who are going to be uh, prima donna quite yet. Huh. Uh, now, if it goes south and he's got this big deal, 
Look, NBA players try to force a trade all the time. Chris Paul did it, and I think that's the big fear. But you got to secure him, and a lot of times in these situations, money talks more than anything else. Former Pelicans coach Monty Williams, former now. Where is he now? Did he, did he get he a He took job the lead position? assistant job under Billy Donovan uh, in Oklahoma City. So he's going into a pretty nice situation, and yet there's some flux there. Uh, they don't know if Kevin Durant's going to be around for the long and term. And a rival. And, and a, yes, in, uh, Western, in a Western Conference rival, uh, a team they beat out mm. to make it to the playoffs. So uh, okay. it's funny how all these cogs uh, move around. It just keeps on moving. Exactly. All right, Larry, thanks a lot. Errol, over to you. Restaurants need some help. Yeah, the good news is that there's a lot of them in creative, all types of restaurants. The bad news is that they're having difficulty getting um, people to work in them. Uh, there's a real uh, personnel shortage in restaurants. Mostly, uh, really... A critical situation in New Orleans, a little bit of it um, around the country, and part of it more so in New Orleans cause just because there's so much activity um, going on. Uh, one of our publications did an interview with um, Ralph Brennan's, of course, operates Brennan's and recently bought the Napoleon House, and he says the number one problem his company has is personnel, uh, just getting people, and not just starting level, you know, top to bottom. I mean, there is just so much competition for these people and so many jobs that have, have opened. His cousin, and Dickie Brennan, who has several restaurants, has even has a program where they've brought in people from the Philippines, and they're working with them. Uh, most of them are at a level where they're kind of at the entry level, but they're trying to encourage them to work their ways up also. Uh, there's a, a program between the um, Louisiana Restaurant Association and Camellia Beans, where they're trying to work through the schools, have some sort of competition about creating um, uh, um, um, recipes. UNO has a hospitality school, but supposedly that's at its maximum right now, and they need even more people. And I guess the big thing down the road is this Louisiana Culinary Institute, uh, which is in the old Artworks building downtown off of Howard Avenue. This was a building that stood empty for years, and there was uh, went up for sale in a group that included Dickie Brennan, and in partnership with Delgado, what um, wound up getting the building, and they're, they're restoring that. It's a big building. And they're going to make it, and it's due to open in the fall of 2016. So even once it opens, it's going to be a while before it's starting to produce people. I guess it's like what NOCA has been to, uh, to entertainment. I guess the hoping that this would be for the restaurant industry. But in the meantime, there are some big gaps that need to be filled, and restaurants are trying to do as much as they can internally. But, but boy, if someone's looking for a career, and if they want to, if they, if they want to go where the jobs are, that the, that the jobs are certainly in the, in the restaurant industry. Opportunity there. I understand that the Dickey Brendan Restaurant Group is actually starting an apprenticeship program, and that's really with the kitchen staff where some cooks from or, and, and chefs from the different restaurants will apprentice with some of their top chefs to really train them even more so in the kitchen. Than I think Dickie Brennan has really become a, one of the people at the forefront of this whole whole issue because also of his involvement with the Culinary Institute. And, and you know, he has several restaurants now, and he, he needs them all. And, and he's doing you know, really high-end restaurants. And so it's you want to develop the best people to be able to operate the kind of restaurants that he has. And even in high schools now with the Jump Start program, um, in the state public schools, the culinary program is considered a jumpstart career pathway so that kids in high school can start get a tra getting training in the culinary program and even get certification for it. And it's a good career for developing people skills if you've been removed, if when you're growing up, if you've been removed from people skills. And it's also a career in which there are options as you get more involved with it because there's always somebody wanting to start another restaurant or another idea out there. Because we certainly so, do like yeah. to eat so here. So you can in develop this area. people <laughs> skill and you can have the, you have the options. So. Yeah, you definitely have a clientele out there. Okay, thanks a lot, Errol. The Saints. The Saints had their OTA. What is an OTA? It's an organized team activity. It's code for if you're a player, you can skip it and you don't get fined. No. But it's it's a basically <laughs> a practice, and yet it's not shoulder pads. Uh, and I, I can't believe we're actually talking about football. I thought we were just going to talk about Tom Benson the whole time. No, <laughs> but uh, no, they, they've wrapped up two weeks of that. They have another week of OTAs, and then they have a mandatory mini camp where if you skip, you do get fined. That's uh, in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Then you have a five-week layoff, and then we all jettison back up to West Virginia, uh, back up to the Greenbrier for training camp. So it's you're starting to get a feel of maybe what they're trying to do. Uh, I think they're tinkering a lot. There's a lot of tinkering that needs to happen because – they can't go seven and nine uh, for the third year in the last four. That that this is a critical year for the Saints. You know, speaking of Greenbrier, when the Saints tanked last year, some people said, "Well, maybe it was the problem was that training camp that it was too that it was too lush up there." Some people do say that. <laughs> I, I disagree. Uh, I, I think it was a welcome change for them, 
And yet, I'll tell you what tanked. The defense tanked. They went from number four to 31. It didn't have anything to do with uh, practice uh, in, in nice conditions. It's not like they went out and played golf every day. That's not the case. It was a normal training camp. And look, the offense, the offensive line got Drew Brees sacked a lot. So it wasn't because uh, they were... Uh, enjoying summer vacation yeah. up in up in West Virginia. But, but on the defense, you hear talk about Rob Ryan saying we're going to make the defense less complex. Now that was too complicated. Well, it's a big knock on him. He tries to make it too complicated. And I think Sean Payton, uh, by bringing in a guy he knows and he trusts, Dennis Allen, as say a senior defensive assistant, uh, I think uh, that will help maybe get the defense back on track. But here's one thing: I bring up Dennis Allen and Rob Ryan. I'm not. I'm convinced if they start off one and three and the defense is no good, Rob Ryan will be out and Dennis Allen will be in uh, right. because he's a former head coach for Oakland, did well as a defensive coordinator for the Broncos. So it's what? it's it's make or break all over the place. Did Rob Ryan was he on his staff in Oakland when he was the defensive no, coordinator? No, 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 he was not. Uh, oh. No, he was not. That was a few years ago. So yeah, because he went from Oakland to Dallas, Dallas right. to New Orleans. So you're saying they're tinkering a little bit. What's the focus of this tinkering at this point? Would you well, say you got to get be better on defense because you went from four to thirty. <laughs> well, stop being it. so complicated. Right, right. <laughs> Sack the quarterback, create a turnover. But no, offensively too. Like, like, the Saints, uh, they took a step back a bit. They've got to learn to to move on without Jimmy Graham. Uh, they've got to move, learn to move on without Kenny Stills. Uh, they've got a new center. Uh, they got some uh, uh, unestablished pieces uh, at wide receiver, and Drew Brees isn't getting any younger. So this is a critical year for the Saints. Okay, it is time for us now to look ahead. Errol. I'm told that the progress is really good in restoring the uh, Orpheum Theater downtown, which is good news, and that they're looking at having some sort of an event opening in August, but the actual official opening by mid-September. So that'll be back into our life, and that'll really be a, a great moment in our recovery. Oh, that's a great to asset. To have the Orpheum back. Thanks, Errol. Stephanie. Uh, June 24th, Bobby Jindal, who is at 1% in the last national poll, has an announcement in New Orleans. I wonder what it could be. <laughs> at 1%. 1 so he has to come up if he wants to be in the first debate. Remember, debates. he'll have about a month and a half at that point to try to get into that top 10 if he wants right. to make the presidential debates. If not, I think it'll be very hard to continue. Yeah. Okay, Stephanie, thanks. Larry. We've talked football. We've talked basketball. Let's go up to Baton Rouge for baseball. LSU taking on UL Lafayette. We're guaranteed one Louisiana team in the College World Series, and this Super Regional will probably be about as fierce as the one uh, rivalry-wise as we've seen uh, back in 2001 when LSU played Tulane in Zephyr Field, and Tulane won. So this is fierce rivals. Uh, LSU has one of their best teams we've seen in a long time. Uh, so it's it's going to be a fun series up in Alex Box Stadium. All right, Larry, thanks. David. And Monday is the final filing deadline for BP oil spill claims. It's hard to believe yes. five years after the spill, three years still, after the settlement, yeah. it's still you can still, still file claim. a claim. And, but the uh, claims facility is staying open all weekend at their office in Metairie, 9 to 5 Saturday and Sunday, and until midnight on Monday to take in the last of these claims. And okay. there's tens of thousands of them coming in in the last month. That's amazing. Okay, David, thanks. Thanks, you guys, for being here. Thank you all for joining us, and we want to see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. <laughs>